Welcome to today's session. My name is Doris Bunchu. I am architect of subscription order management working in SAP product engineering. And I want to guide you through the latest features of S4 HANA subscription order management, which have been released by today. So RTC was today and we will now run through the latest functionalities which are published now. And if you have questions, then raise them in the chat and we will try to answer them at the end of the session. So let me first talk about subscription order management in general and what's the purpose for subscription order management. So what you can here see on the slide is the whole um, BRIM process for starting with product modeling via order quotation, contract management, including um, usage collection with mediation, pricing and charging with SAP conversion charging, then running through uh, billing settlement processes in conversion invoicing, doing revenue share processes and uh, running all these payment processes in FICA, finally also ending up in accounting and revenue accounting. And what our solution subscription order management is focusing on is the part about product modeling and the part about quotations, orders, and contract management. In addition, we have also um, integration into SAP configure price quote. And as a roadmap item, we're also looking into integrations for SAP entitlements management, but this is still not live, but roadmap here. And for sure, subscription order management is close integrated with convergent charging, with convergent invoicing, and also with FICA. What we will have is a list of topics for today, and this is now the full overview, what we offer in our new release. And in the slides after that, I will deep dive in some of these processes. So let's first go to what functionalities do we now ship with the latest release? This is a lot of functionalities around contract lifecycle management. So the first one is lock unlock change processes. Here we um, have extended our change processes that you do not only lock the FICA provider contract, but based on which lock you're setting, you can now define which lock types are set in the FICA and CI processes, for example, like uh, setting a done in lock, setting an invoicing lock um, based on the profile you have defined. In addition, phased contracts was a functionality which we already had shipped with the last release. And with this release, we have now extended phased contract features. We can now extend contract phases. So we can either extend the last contract phase or we can add an additional extension phase. I will explain the difference in the slide later. In addition, we have open phased contracts for the correct error change process and we support the reject all also for phased contracts. Next point is contract transfer. A contract transfer is also, so the core functionality has already been shipped also with the last release and we expanded that now um, so that we can transfer single items. So what is a contract transfer? We have a running contract and for uh, a certain business reason, may it be, uh, for example, a change of a sold to or any other changes which really requires the creation of a new contract in FICA, we can take the old contract, copy it, and transfer the data, including the CC data, to a new one. And what is new now here in this release is that we can do that also now, meanwhile, not just on a header level for the change of soul to, but we can also do that now for item level. And especially we can do that within the same contract document. Pictures will later explain uh, the real differences here. We also worked on uh, contract activation in the past. 
This is a feature which also already existed, but we extended that also that contract cancellation in the past is now working seamlessly. And this is all that so this is also working in combination with this already mentioned contract transfer process. In addition, we implemented some checks uh, when you try to change a technical resource in the past because you would run in distribution errors in some cases. And all these features are also fully supported now via API. Last but not least, we did also some adjustments in some general change processes. So the uh, extension change process um, is now also automatically extending the sub item in case that the sub item has the same contract end date. In addition, we did some UI adjustments uh, on the contract so that you can, for example, work on the sub and the main item in the same process UI. And we did some UI, uh, UI harmonization in respect to text, uh, texts on the cancellation pop-ups. The other functionalities are now less on contract lifecycle management, but our next big block was that we have developed a Fiori app about display allowances. So you can see allowances now collecting data from conversion invoicing, conversion charging, and subscription order management and combining that into one app. We will have a look at this app and also in the session then. And um, more for reference, one of our fields, which we originally had placed on the product master data has been moved to another app. Uh, you can now find this field, uh, so the technical resource assignment schema on the app for subscription specific product data because it's much better placed from business process there. Then we have also done some uh, improvements on the order capture process. So you can now assign an external purchase order number also for subscription items and it's inherited up until the FICA process. And we have enhanced the search of solution quotations that you can search it by external reference number, for example, the CPQ quotation ID or a business solution portfolio ID. In addition, you can maintain um, custom price conditions and master agreements. And um, we can also exchange the master agreement during a change of so to or a product change. This is also something which did not work in the last release. We have enabled that now. So when you run through a product change, your old master agreement definitely will be unvalid. And then you have to attach or you can attach a new one to use then the new master agreement. To open our solution also for other use cases, we are strongly focused also on the topic APIs and events. So we have built a big set of business events for subscription contracts and subscription orders. And we have enhanced our existing APIs with additional fields to support more use cases, especially for the CPQ integration. And the biggest feature here in addition was that we now support also manual variant prices via API. From integration perspective, yeah, we are working together now with CPQ, uh, but this was rolled out in other sessions. And um, just for reference, uh, also on the data, data archiving, we now support ILM notifications. So let's jump into the details and first go with contract lifecycle management. <coughs> Sorry. So a phased contract is a contract where you split your contract phases um, already in advance when you are in the contract creation phase. So you know, for example, in year one, you will have a contract with um, 20 um, cloud seats and in year two, you will have 50. And in year three, you will go to the platinum contract and buy another 500 seats. And you could in the past run it by changes, by change processes, this was always possible, but this phased contracts really offer you to plan such a contract already in advance and inform also the follow-up processes about what your contract will be adjusted in the next years, months, however it is used. And what we in addition now provide is if such a phased contract comes to an end, we say we can 
extend the last phase. So this means we copy the last phase and extend the uh, set a new contract end date to it. Or if you say, okay, I, I'm not uh, okay with a platinum contract. I want to go back to silver, but buy another thousand seats. This would be much more an add extension phase where you can put an additional contract phase in the app. The other two is uh, more a technical thing. When a phase contract runs in a distribution error, you can correct the errors now. You can open it partially on a UI to, to do some corrections here. And as long as the contract is not uh, fully distributed, so not technically active yet, you can use the recheck all functionality uh, if this contract shall not come to life. So let's have a look at these both different change processes, the add extension phase and the other one. So what happens during add extension phase? Let's assume I have a contract, a phase contract. In the first phase, I want to have a quantity 10 and have a price of $10. And in the second phase, I want to have a quantity 20 and plan a price for $9 for this one. And the old contract has a duration of three years. And now the use case is, I want to add another phase where I say the parameters for this phase are really different. So I want to have a different quantity, different price, maybe different configuration or whatever you need to change. And in that case, you can use this change process add extension phase. And then this additional phase is added to the end. In that case, um, the items are, yeah, okay, what's recreated or not, we will see on the next slide. So this is how such a add extension phase contract looks like after the extension has been run through. So originally we had um, a phase one, which is already passed and a phase two, which is currently active. And now I want to add a phase three. So what would this contract do? Phase one already had been passed, so it's anyhow a historical one. Phase two is now delimited and recreated, and phase three is added in addition. That's how it looks like. This can be even more complex when phase one is active, two and three are planned, four is added, similar picture. Then you have two futures, an additional added, and here the old ones, which are then historical for tracking reasons. The big advantage of add extension phase is that you can do that anytime. So you do not want, need to wait until your last contract time slice is used so that you are in your last phase, but you can really do that at any time when your contract is done. The disadvantage is so you have always to send, send the full contract structure. And uh, this has some impact on how the payload looks like, which you send over the API. It's uh, much more complex than with the other change process. The uh, extend last phase uh, is slightly different. So here we are now already in the last contract phase and I more or less want to continue this contract. So I just want to adjust the end date. So what happens here is the phase two is just extended means I put a new end date to it, but keep all other parameters and sets it more or less. And this change process can only be used uh, during the last phase. Uh, the purpose for that is that you can um, in future think about automatic extension of such contracts. So extend last phase looks much more easy then. So you, you have your, your already past phase one, and your phase two is replaced by a new one with a new date. Good, jumping to next topic. So switch away from phase contracts, switch to item trans to contract transfer. So what we have here is you have a contract and you want to really change essential parameters of your contract, which you cannot change by running a simple change process and creating a new time slice. There are, for example, if you need to change org structure data or if you need to change uh, so too, or in some cases, if you need to change a product. 
In such cases, we use this single item transfer. And there are two ways to do this transfer now. We have two strategies how to do that. So let's go through this picture. Strategy N, new subscription contract document, means we take an item here, we run through that change process, and this change process will close the old one and copy whatever is required to the new one. The old one is delimited and the new one is fully recreated, including whatever is required in the respect to conversion charging, billing plans, and so on. The strategy U is pretty similar, but the big difference is you do that within the same contract document. So in a contract document, you can have multiple contracts connected together. And you choose now one of them, let's say it's a 789, you cancel the 789 and do the same what you saw in the slide before, but you put this together in the same contract document. So the difference here is new contract document, here it is same contract document. We heard both use cases from customer and that's why we provide now both solutions. And you can define in customizing how you want to have it. If for example, your contract customer is using this number as a reference and you want to keep this number stable, strategy U is perfectly fine. If you want to really separate this and have a net new subscription contract document, strategy N might be maybe your choice. If you run through a normal change process because you do not need a new contract number here in FICA, then you choose a strategy space and do whatever you have ever done in the past, run through a normal change process. So how does this now look like in screenshots? Here we have the N. So here you can see, originally I had the contract with a 90. Then I run through the transfer process and now I have a new one where I copied over all data and I have the contract with a 03 and there's a link between these both contracts. Old contract knows to which new contract it was copied and vice versa. The old one is delimited, the new one is created automatically. With you, it looks a little bit different. You can see here the old contract the number 11, it runs through this change process, copies everything, but it does not open a new contract document, but creates it as a new item in the same contract document. And still the relation, so seeing which contract was copied to which one is here also in the external reference assignment block. By that, I would like to close this topic about transfer, and I want to switch to lock unlock. In the past releases, you already could run through a lock pro change process and again also through the unlock change process. And what we originally did is set a lock on the FICA provider contract, but we had customer requirements who wanted to set these locks much more explicit. And we provide now a customizing where we really can define a uh, lock reason, which is then related to several FICA settings. So we have a customizing here where you can say my lock reason, lock reason, call it three. Maybe you will have a better name for your customers. And in that case, you can say, if I set this lock reason, I want to have an invoicing lock, or I want to have a payment or a dunning lock or I just want to lock the billing plan. Whatever is required will be copied in here, uh, will be set here. And by selecting your lock reason, you can then define what happens really on your FICA objects. In addition, that's also important to know is that we have restructured the customizing here. So in, originally this were multiple tables. Now it's a few cluster where you maintain all at one place. The old customizing is still visible and the old customizing is also still supported. But if you want to create new entries, you have to use the new ones and can easily 
switch the scenarios from old to new, but for certain for several releases, we will still support the old scenarios. And the old settings are still available, fully accessible, but just for display only. For past dated changes, we did, yeah, well, let's say it, a lot of research here, how it is finally working, how, how the things are connected together. And past dated changes, at least for most of the processes, were all always working already in the past. But we had a few at some special change processes and really deep dived into that one and uh, put some functionalities together that this uh, gave a round picture here. So what we now also can do is cancellation in the past. Uh, you can really cancel the contract in the past. You can execute contract transfers in the past. And what we implemented is if you have a technical resource change in the past and there is already usage on it, you will get an um, um, a error because you would definitely run into distribution errors, which are hard to fix. And we check that now already in advance. In addition, we combined that with also another existing feature, namely the automatic adjustment of billable items uh, when they are requested from a CI billing plan. So if you do a cancellation in the past, if there are already bits of the billing plans and they are automatically reversed and recreated. And um, if you uh, have CC in the game, here we do not have automatism, but we test it together with uh, reversal and um, re-rating. And this is also all working via API. So here I have a simulation. And that's more for reference what happens now during such a change process um, in the past. So let's assume we are here today, mid of August, and uh, my customer is saying, oh, I need to definitely change this um, to mid of June. So, but I have already bits here running. The problem is now I cannot do that change if I already have bits here. It's raising an error in the FICA. So what we do is now, we, you have first to manually reverse the CC bits. But then the next step is fully automated. And if you do not have CC bits, the whole process is fully automated. So the system will then reverse the CI bits here. So these are still there, they will be reversed. And I will create a new item with a new quantity. For example, from one, I change it to 10. We will recreate the billing plan. And then we will also re-request the billing plan. And if you run a re-rating, the CC bits will also be re -re uh, recreated. Good. Then last point for contract lifecycle is contract changes. Here, oh, oh, OK, so this is just one slide where I mentioned what we had done. And the most important thing to know here is that this extension or automatic extension of a sub item. So in the past, you had to extend the main item and then auto, uh, in addition, also the sub item. And now if they have the same end date and I run an extension change process or even an auto extension change process on a um, main item, the sub item will also be automatically extended so that it's not uh, left behind. Good, this was my point with contract lifecycle management. And as next topic, I would run to display allowances. This is a new app which we have created. And with this app, we allow a holistic view on allowances and on the monetary value which um, the allowance has been already created or consumed. Uh, you can track, uh, you can see uh, which allowances have been created in conversion charging. You can navigate to multiple objects like navigate to conversion invoicing and see the single bits, navigate from there to the products. You can see the allowance definition tables. You can navigate even to your business partner. And the last feature or an, uh, and pretty important feature is also even from ZUI, you can also trigger the allowance refill directly in conversion charging. So let's see what we have here. 
when you start this display allowances app, you can search for allowances. Uh, no, sorry, you can search for contracts. And the search criterion, and this is important to know, is not that this contract has an allowance, because here and then we would have to call to CC every time. The search criteria is at least the contract has a cross catalog mapping. So this is something we can easily check. We cannot call for each contract. Do you have allowances? This is something we can technically not check. But when you then have your contract and want to monitor your allowance, you will navigate into that. And now you can see multiple things here. So you can see here your contract data. You can see several KPIs here. You can see the allowances which are read directly from CC and the allowance definitions, which are the mapping tables which describe the allowances. And here you find this refill button. These values here are taken from conversion invoicing. So they are calculated based on the billable items which are sent to conversion invoicing. So a refill will send an allowance creation bit and uh, allowance consumption will send an allowance usage bit. And based on this information, we can also say how much has been consumed already. In addition, you can also navigate in these details and we do this um, reporting thing or this uh, yeah, calculation also on a single allowance level. And from here, for example, for this allowance, you can then directly navigate into billable item monitor. And you can also see which counters are defined for this allowance. And the same for the allowance definition table, you can see uh, what were the values which I had defined for this allowance, to which charge plan is it allow, um, assigned. I can also trigger my refills here. And also here I do my calculation based on the uh, allowance definition. And same here, even in the charge plan details, I can trigger this refill allowances. So depending on the level where you want to see and trigger your allowances, but mostly easiest thing is to do it directly from the entry screen. For this one, I have a video and I will now switch to this video. Great, then I will start this video now and do some explanations on the fly. And uh, well, from time to time, I will move, move a little bit forward because one or other thing I've already explained. So what is happening through, during such an allowance process is, that you first model your subscription product and in co conversion charging, you model your allowance model. And both are is then connected via cross catalog mapping and subscription order management during product model modeling. Then you create your subscription order, your subscription contract, and then you distribute this contract also to conversion charging. And that is the first moment where re a real allowance is then created in conversion charging. And we receive a creation bit for this allowance in, in conversion invoicing. Next step is now that you start using your allowance. And by using this allowance, you consume the allowance and we send usage bit back to, to the backend. And when your allowance is consumed, you can decide to refill it. And in addition, by monitoring all these bits, allowance bits and creation bits, we are also fully integrated into CC and you can always see the KPIs changing here. So let me move to contract creation process now. So here I create now a subscription order with an allowance. So here you can see in this product, I have included allowances with two mapping tables. And so one is a big, uh, a small allowance uh, package, a small data packet with a short validity. And the other one is a bigger data packet, packet with a longer validity. And the system is now set up that it will create both allowances already when the contract is created. So let's have a look at this contract. So I can see our contract has now the allowances assigned and it's also distributed to conversion charging. So here is my contract in conversion charging and I can see that these both allowances are now created. And this was a way how we checked such things in the past. And when you 
go now to the app, you will see that we can see that all now within this Fiori app. So I enter just my contract number here, navigate in, and now you can see this contract data. In addition, you see also that contract has, has a certain validity and that the allowances have a certain balance now. And I can also see these are the both allowances which I have been seeing in CC and I also can see my allowance definitions here. I can also navigate in these parts and get all my allowance details and I can accumulate my data here uh, on the uh, values I see with which values my allowance had been loaded and also which counters I currently have in CC. So you do not need to go in the CC system to get these details. Same here, you do not need to open a mapping table. You can do that if you like to, the link is available, but we put also such information here in the UI directly. So next step is now I want to start consuming my allowance. So uh, I did that via a report simulating some usage here. Let me skip a little bit to keep time. Okay, here we go. We have now meanwhile created usage. I send this to CC. And when we look now uh, into the conversion charging, I can see my allowance has been started consuming. So the counters on the allowance changed now. And uh, the counters for consumption is gone. So the C1 is gone to zero. And um, the other one, the big allowance. So originally it was something like 101 when I remember correctly. And the second one, um, the counter is also gone down to, um, so it was originally loaded with 500 and I have four, 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 116 left. So again, I do not need to see that in CC. I can see that directly. And in addition, I get the information. I have a big part of my allowances is now consumed. Why is this a negative amount? Because my allowance is set up in a way that I um, can use more than what I had paid. But this strongly depends on your allowance model. And I can directly navigate into conversion invoicing and see the single bits how my allowance has been now consumed from monetary perspective. So here is um, the other allowance, which is not fully consumed yet, but still also here I can see some billable items which uh, already started consuming this one. And you see, I went here on status red. So I decided, okay, I need to refill my allowance. I decide on which parameters I want to refill. So I have the choice between several now. And I start here my refill process. And this will, uh, when it's done, create an, a new allowance in the CC system. So let's check again in CC that there's a new allowance now. So I find now a new allowance in CC, which has now been again loaded with a new data bucket. And in my app, I can again directly see that there's now an additional allowance a, uh, available. And I also can see when I come back that my KPI is now again green. So again, I have allowance value available. And this was this video. So let's stop this one here and go back to sharing the slides. So with this video, I close now the allowance topic and I will go to the topic APIs. So we have um, mostly for, for the transactional processing, three APIs, which are pretty important. So that is the subscription contract read API, where we added several new fields. We have the solution quotation API, and we have a SOAP API for order creation. And we, uh, when we built new functionalities, 
these functionalities and fields are also exposed via these APIs. So this, this is, uh, you can also find these APIs in the API Business Hub, where you also can see which fields are available on the, uh, as, uh, on the APIs. This thing about manual variant condition is the following. When you have an external solution like a CPQ system or a custom pricing um, machine where you say, I want to determine my prices fully outside of the SAP system or outside of the SOM solution, let's call it like this. In that case, we can take manual prices from outside and accept whatever you send us. This did not work for variant prices in the past. And here we had to be somehow trust, uh, we somehow had to trust that the system in the back end and the system in the front end, which calculates the original price, do the same job. And we opened this now and that also for manual variant prices. So um, prices based really on variant configuration such prices can also now be passed as manual conditions. So we take what the external solution has calculated and do not recalculate in the backend. So we would override what is, is calculated in the backend by a manual price, which is coming from outside. You can use that, you do not need to use that when you work with variant conditions. You can also say we let the backend still calculate. Then in addition, we provide a certain set of events. The so one set of events is for subscription orders. And with subscription orders, we provide internal events where we inform that a subscription order has been created, changed or deleted. You can use that events for internal applications the big difference to that is for subscription contract, we went a step beyond and we offer this also as cloud events. So we can also connect, for example, to SAP event mesh to send these events out and they can be, can, can be consumed as cloud events um, for, for integration scenarios. In addition, so we send a certain set of events like contract is created, contract is updated, but also some special changes like contract um, is extended or quantity changed or um, yeah, list will come in a minute. As you may have some contract data may be pretty special. Maybe you do not want to send out an event for every case. That's why we also provided a body here. And you find all these events also in SAP API Hub. So let's have a look here. Um, contract creation, we send um, four events. So when the subscription contract is initially created, uh, the event is called state created. When the contract is still not technically active, you know it can be changed. And if such a change happens, uh, we will send the event scheduled changed or in case uh, this uh, contract item or this contract is rejected, then we will send the event rejected. And finally, when contract distribution happens and this is technically active, then we send the event activated. Creation part is simple. Now coming to the change part. Here we offer some more change processes. So when I trigger a change process and it's created initially, then we send the event state changed, or for some change processes, we have special events like canceled, extended, product changed, and quantity changed. And you can decide on customizing if you want to send the generic one, or if you want to send um, the state changed event or nothing. This is now a part of the change process customizing. When the change is not, it's a future change. It is not technically active yet, so you can still update it. And in that case, if a change which has already been sent once is changed again, we send the event scheduled change, or 
if it's rejected, we send change rejected. And then same, when it's finally getting activated, we send change activated event. And then you always know now something happened on my contract. You can use these events and by um, technically called it's no, um, notify and re, um, uh, yeah, we first notify the um, applications and then they can call back and use our contract read API to get all contract data which uh, is required for any integration scenario here. And by that, I am done with um, my slides. I want to give, bring your attention to the general hints. So we have a product assistance where you really can also read the details, of what's new information. Uh, we explain in our product assistant uh, very detailed how, how it's working, how things fit together. In addition, also same is done for the APIs and for the APIs, I really can also point to API Business Hub. You find it under api.sap.com and you can find payloads, API descriptions. For integration scenarios, you can find guides and so on. And for sure, we also have a prim product page where you find integration guides, migration guides, and all related documents, which we try to keep always on track and um, try to update them close to the latest release. Then, well, our application component, in case there is um, a bug or a feature request, you need to send it, uh, then you uh, create an incident on CRMS for some. And if you're interested in sizing, there's a quick sizer available, which also covers our scenarios. And by that, I say thank you. And I, we can start a Q&A session if there are any questions. Okay, I can find one can faced contract created from Fiori solution quote or only through solution quote API. Yeah, it can only be created for the time being via solution quotation API. And phase contract via subscription order, not with this release. So answer live. Is the question by that answered? Okay. Are there any other questions? You can also unmute yourself. Not sure. Okay, there are two more in the chat. Can we find the slides or recording? Um, I guess administrator uh, or the, 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 um, the team from uh, SAP Education will send this out after the session is closed. Some customers have portals for ordering subscriptions and as tax and discounts are calculated during billing and invoicing, is here, any functionality available to get the simulated price with tax and discount so that while placing customer order can see final price which is being charged. Yeah, <laughs> okay. It depends a little bit on so ex if the external system calculates the price uh, and the taxes, or now let's say it fire differently. So the real final taxing is done in CI. And if you if we do taxing in subscription order management, this is more like a, a, a proposed tax. So because we don't exactly know what will be the conditions which are finally used in conversion invoicing when the real taxing happens. But nevertheless, um, the pricing procedure used internally for taxing is um, can be kept in sync with all these taxing rules like uh, attaching a vertex or things like that. If you fully do it externally, you must ensure that your external system is in sync with what is uh, then finally happening in billing and invoicing. Question two. Is it possible to mention quantity on subscriptions as one customer have requirement that if you buy five subscriptions that you can get 10% discounts and if you buy 10 subscriptions then you get can, can get 20% of discounts. You can set up such things in your pricing procedure. Um, you can either 
work with um, stage prices, or you have to define a, a discounting rule where you then determine the discount. Any further? Ah, is there more? Or are we good? Okay. I do not see any further questions. By that, if there are no further questions, I say thank you for your participation. Thank you.